about. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Hi, everyone. We are back with everyone's favorite, Jenna. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing uh, narrative design. And uh, Jenna, it's all yours. Hi. All right. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Can you guys see it okay? Yep, fantastic. Cool. So last talk that I gave, I was just giving a brief overview on how I talk about narrative design and game writing and just kind of conceptually what those are. So today I'm going to be getting a little bit more specific on how you can incorporate different facets of your game, specifically platformers, because that's what you guys are making for the most part, um, and how you can use those different aspects of your game to help convey the story. So let's get into it. Uh, intro slide. It's me. Some of you might have been here for the talk that I gave a few weeks ago, uh, but if you haven't, hi, my name is Jenna. I'm a narrative designer. I work at co-op. I grew up near Washington, D.C. and now live in Washington State. It's confusing. Washington State is better. Uh, I also forgot to do this last time. My pronouns are they them. Um, this is my horrible son, Onion, who is currently screaming somewhere, and I may need to go run and grab him depending on if he decides to turn his words into actions, because he's he's up to something right now. Um, these are some of the games that I've worked on. Uh, I currently am focusing all of my attention on Goodbye Volcano High, which is launching next month. Very big, very scary. Um, but the rest, I've done a variety of things, ranging from editing to writing to narrative design to illustration. Um, but that's, oh yeah, that's the other thing. I have a background in illustration, which uh, I think honestly helps my narrative design practice quite a bit. So today's overview, this is the second of two presentations I'm giving this year. Um, if you missed the last one, it's recorded, it's up on YouTube. I also have my previous talks from previous years up on YouTube, which uh, are still about narrative design practices, but they go for slightly different things each year because that's something I kind of push myself to do is to give the basics, but in different ways. Um, so just going over the elements of a platformer. By this point in the program, I believe you guys have all started to work on your prototypes. Um, so these are the expectations as they've been explained to me. They're going to be single player games. They're small scale. I'm assuming like one level, maybe two if you're feeling crazy. Uh, and with basic platformer mechanics that are conventional to the genre with like running and jumping, uh, shooting things perhaps, and then hazards, etc. cetera. Um, and even though you guys, some of you might be making games. Of... I don't know if you guys heard that. Hold on. My apologies. everything on sorry i'm trying to keep him distracted in one location so i have a tube and he will not leave me alone until uh he is allowed to have anything from it so bear with me my friends okay here we go um so even though some of you guys might be making a game other than a platformer uh, the basic considerations of narrative design are largely the same. Uh, I'm just giving you guys these expectations of the different elements of your game just as like a starting point, but ultimately like the practice remains the same. So starting off, we're going to talk about the mechanics of the game. So the way that narrative and mechanics go together is when you start to prototype and pitch your game, the first basic components are your mechanics. It's what most people expect from a game. Um, and expanding beyond a proof of concept requires to decide what the player's objective is. So the mechanics are essentially the tools of the game. What are you asking them to do with them? Like, what do those tools mean to them? Narrative essentially justifies and explains these mechanics. It gives them reason to use them. 
Um, oh goodness. Sorry, he's also sitting on my keyboard. Boy, come here. Get a little butt off my keyboard. Thank you, sir. Um, so narrative design serves to let you tell a story to the player through the actions they perform and the systems they participate in, which if you saw my previous talk this year or any other year, that's what I talk about every time. Um, but here's some examples of narrative and mechanics kind of overlapping. In Breath of the Wild, Link's abilities are provided to him through a unique piece of ancient technology that allows him to interface with the world differently from other characters because no one else has that piece of technology other than him. Uh, in Tears of the Kingdom, similar stitch, except instead of technology, it's like the hand of, you know, a dead guy. Uh, in Final Fantasy 16, the new, this is mildly spoiler, I guess, I'm, my apologies, but the main character, Clive, his new abilities are obtained after narrative milestones in the story where he defeats for the most part, but essentially just ends up absorbing parts of different icons into him. That's how new things are given to him is after certain conditions in the story are met. And then in Transistor, which is one of my favorite games and by a studio that I mention almost every year in my slides, uh, Red, the main character's new abilities are obtained from the bodies of her dead citizens who are processed and then downloaded into her sword. Additionally, which is, this is one of my favorite things about this game, you actually learn more lore in the game depending on how you utilize the abilities and different combinations you use them in, which promotes gameplay, experimentation, and narrative exploration together. Um, but something else that we're going to talk about a lot in this talk today is the idea of ludonarrative dissonance, which is a big word, I'm sorry. Um, but the, the ludo is the root word from Latin meaning I play. So that plus narrative is the inter intersection of games and story. Ludonarrative dissonance specifically is when there is a noticeable disconnect between the two, the player's experience within the game and their ex experience with the story being told. And essentially the two contradict each other in such a way that it's noticeable to the player and can interrupt their immersion. So here's an example of dissonance. Being hailed as a compassionate hero in a game where you also slaughter thousands of enemies, maybe even innocent people. Another example, a player being treated as a lower class citizen in the city building game that gives you the power to literally reshape the world and make decisions that impact the people who in fiction have power over you. Now let me go back to that. So ludonarrative dissonance is not inherently a bad thing, but too much of it will disrupt players' experiences and may drive them out. So you need to be conscious of it. And if you ever have it in your game, it's best to wield it intentionally. So moving on from mechanics, which are the tools, here's the world that you're building with those tools, uh, for those tools to be used in. So the world that you built in your game story is not going to be viewable in its entirety to your players. Um, they, you can tell me everything ranging from the plate tectonics to like what kind of God people believe in, but your players aren't going to actually see that stuff from themselves unless it's in the levels and the small, like the, the worlds you build out for them to actually go into. Um, and honestly, you can write all of these lore entries, but that's only really interesting to a small slice of players. And that slice of players is less likely to play a platformer. Explorable areas in a game are the windows to the world. You can think of them that way. They're also the opportunity for less restrictive and um, less linear storytelling. There's this idea of environmental storytelling, which is when you use elements of the world to show a story rather than tell the player everything word for word. So rather than having a character out deliberately outline every single fact and facet of a game, of a, something that happened near them, you can imply the story through elements like you see the ruins of a house and like a doll a child left behind and you can be like oh somebody lived here and they were killed or like the house burned down depending on the ruins and like how old the child was based on how like what kind of toy was left behind stuff like that um and level design if you're doing it 
with narrative in mind, it requires you to balance both world building and game design and can lead to dissonance if you're not careful. For example, if you're in a place that the game is telling you is a peaceful meadow and there's uh, not, a, and it's not very dangerous, so people go there all the time, you're not expect you're telling the players essentially to not expect a ton of crazy hazards unless things are changing and they've been given cause to believe that stuff is there. Environmental storytelling is really useful if you want to tell a specific story with your game through the assets. Um, so the assets you make for your levels should serve both a practical and aesthetic function. The player should be able to look at them and understand that those are, they are what they are in the game. So like, for example, in a platformer, the assets you make for the platforms themselves, the player should be able to look at them and visually understand they can jump on there, but they should also serve an aesthetic function that helps imply the level that they're in is still within the world that they're being told they're in and can help set the stage for whatever interactions you have to come. Um, gray boxing, which is when you just do the absolute bare minimum of making your platforms with no real attention to the aesthetics of them, that's fine for prototyping, but having unique environmental assets shows the player where they are in the world and can help guide their attention to important narrative and mechanical waypoints. So I'm going to give an example of environmental storing, storytelling and level design in the next few slides. So this is Transistor by Supergiant Games, most recently known for Hades and the upcoming Hades 2. Um, this is a screenshot of what the game looks like in one of the early phases. The premise of the game is that you play as red in a city called Cloud Bank, which is slowly being processed by these creatures in white. Uh, and when they are processing the city, these pillars show up, they start to overwrite the way the city looks and makes them bland and kind of like rebuild looking and actually kind of reverts them to looking almost gray box themselves. Um, but this is what the game looks like. You can see like over here, there's not much processing going on, but then the further in you go, you see this side of the building has the process, um, has effects on it. There's a corpse over here that's slowly starting to become processed. Uh, and then you can see that the pillars continue at the further down you go, implying there's more to find. Versus later in the game, in this boss fight, it's almost entirely processed in this area. Um, and you can see that this door over here is kind of absent of that white, but the entire arena and further down is. And um, because of this boss, the way that they inter the way that they attack is these giant heavy attacks that impact everything around them, including the pillars. Um, and the pillars are here to directly inhibit the mobility of the player uh, and make them more aware and make it a little bit harder for them to escape these heavy attacks. So it's an example of an intersection of world building and level design. So um, we're gonna pause right here and open the floor to some questions before taking a little break. Oh goodness, the Onion Fan Club. Uh, so Jenna, can I ask a question? Yeah, if absolutely. No one has something to say. Uh, do you mind going back to the slide right before? Yeah, sure. Yeah, also sorry about the lag. My internet's uh, been wacky. Um, okay, so uh, in cases like this, uh, would you consider that uh, a narrative designer would also take part in um, in the in in the process of level design, like would they have a hand in not designing the level itself, but discussing how it would interact with the world, or how sorry how the um, the underlying storytelling would go in the level, or is this just exclusively the the work of the level designer? So, just to rephrase the question, how much impact does a narrative designer have on a level's design? 
That's a very good question. And that ultimately varies based on the scale of the team. So let's see, in AAA studios, the narrative designer would have probably absolutely nothing um, to do with this. In the case of Supergiant Games, one of the things that makes the studio and their work so unique is the fact that, hold on. Okay, he's fine. Um, is the fact that because they are a smaller studio, they have a lot more opportunities for all of the disciplines to interact with each other from the jump. So because you guys are going to be working in smaller teams on your platformers, there's a higher chance that whoever is doing narrative design for your games is also going to be doing other roles just because of the nature of balancing the work on these projects. Um, so it gives you a chance to really like take that narrative consideration and apply it to everything, which I think is essentially important, especially important uh, in a small slice of a game where you have less time to tell the story you want to tell. Um, so at my studio, we've got a sizable team and I doubt that I will be really, I, I'm not a level designer by trade, but in the instance that we ever have a game with level design in it, while I won't be the one making the ultimate decisions, I will be available to give feedback and provide examples of player stories and say, I think this level fits into the narrative that I want to tell, or I think this narrative, or I think this experience will contradict the narrative uh, and we'll be able to discuss it from there. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. I um, see one in the chat. We have two more questions. Uh, okay. in if people have their over. hand raised, let's do those first. No, currently uh, hands okay. are all down. All right, sounds so, good. In yeah, that case, just have I, can, I have the ch yeah, I have the chat open. I can read them. Also, your internet. It, it makes you look like you're like stop motion animated. Like it's like every other frame. It's horrible, I'm so sorry. Um, so do I have an example of a game doing Ludo narrative dissonance correctly? Hmm. I'm not really sure. So when I say th that you can wield Ludo narrative dissonance correctly, what I mean, I usually say that as a disclaimer, that means that I I never want anybody to take what I say as the gospel truth and to refuse and to like limit themselves and their own decisions based on what I say, because there's always exceptions to the rules. You're so violent. God. You horrible boy. Jesus, he actually peeled some of the skin off my hand. Um, nasty man. Um, so I don't have any examples of like correct ludo narrative dissonance off the top of my head. Um, but I know that there are some instances in like my own work where I have decided like, okay, well, players may wish they had this option or more strength in this area, but I'm going to intentionally limit them or like excuse scope cuts by saying it's a narrative decision and uh, refusing to concede on that front um, as opposed, okay, unrelated question, best ability combos in Transistor. It's been so long since I've played, um, but I all, but in general, like any game that lets me have like bouncing combos that also explode, um, it's my favorite thing, but dang, I should replay Transistor. It's been forever. Um, I hope that answered your question so far, but let's go ahead and take a five minute break. So it's currently 9.02 my time. I, uh, let's come back at 07. Where is my freaking menu? All right, I'm just gonna pause the there we go. Right. Uh, Ash, is everything okay? 
Hi, welcome back. Congrats on the new laptop to somebody. Uh, let's go ahead and jump back in. So talking about environmental storytelling through level design is gonna be how we jump into the next thing, which is art direction. So we've talked about environmental storytelling, but to get a little broader, there's this idea of visual storytelling, which if you're an artist, you are probably already familiar with the term. If you're not, visual storytelling is the idea of show, don't tell. Rather than explaining the world and its wonders to the player through dialogue, through text, or just through like telling them to their face, the visuals allow for players to discover and understand these things for themselves, maybe even put clues together before the game has explicitly told them something. The elements of visual storytelling are common across mediums and are not just restricted to games. Ideas of composition, framing, contrast, other factors are still things to consider when staging what the player looks at. Um, I think the biggest mistake people make for art direction for a game, or not even art direction for a game, but for like comp composing what a player looks at on their game screen is neglecting visual storytelling and like design theory concepts just because even if you're not trying to make a super artistic game it's still pretty essential for understanding where the player's attention goes and what draws their attention on the screen but this could be a whole other talk so we're going to move on art direction in games it's one of the more obvious ways of incorporating narrative into other disciplines but it's honestly in my in my personal opinion neglected more often than it should be a lot of AAA games, especially, prioritize realism over specificity, as in they choose to look real, photorealistic to the world that we see around us, uh, rather than making things that are specific and unique to the game world that they are creating. The assets created for these games are gorgeous, and they're highly photorealistic, but they tend to be uh, interchangeable and indistinguishable from each other as a result. Also, the other downside of photorealism is that you can only be as realistic as technology allows you to be, and that naturally gets outdated as technology progresses. So a game that was super realistic in 2002 does not look realistic as a game made in 2022. Being deliberate with your style and your artistic choices not only lends your game a unique look and feel, but it also allows you to enhance the mood and emphasize the narrative of your game. These are all different games by different studios with similar color grading and sometimes are even in different genres. Um, I did not have to, when I searched for these screenshots, I literally entered generic terms. I did not hunt for things that were intentionally similar colors. I did not have any search tools enabled. I literally was just like, give me a high resolution picture of a AAA game. As opposed to, these are all from the same franchise. What distinguishes Nintendo um, from other AAA companies aside from their absolutely horrid practices with backward compatibility and like tearing down emulators, uh, they're not interested in being photorealistic with your games. Um, the Legend of Zelda takes place in a different, a world totally different from ours. And they uh, utilize the art direction of these games to make the tone clear just through a screenshot. So like in Link's Awakening down here, everything looks very toy-like, very simplistic. Um, it's very, it's very like beautifully rendered and detailed, but they intentionally go for more cartoonish and toy-like um, aesthetics with their assets because that's the nature of the game that they're trying to convey. Wind Waker is um, cell shaded it's cartoonish, it's about a child rather than like a mature adult Link. Um, it's a pretty, it's driven game, so it's a lot about like the wonders of the world um, and Breath of the Wild, of course, is also exploration driven, but you're going to be exploring a Hyrule that has is post-collapse. Um, so while the world is beautiful, it's also incredibly dangerous. Um, and then Twilight Princess is a game with a very clear story and very like dramatic elements to it that and a pretty darker tone compared to the other games. And that's evident 
in its art direction, not only because of the level of technology and like the abilities of like game engines and rendering, but that's because it's they deliberately chose to use these colors and keep it more muted because obviously they're capable of using bright colors when they want to be. So continuing down the path of visuals and going from art direction, we're gonna talk about user interface and UI and UX. So this they fall under the category of visual storytelling. Wow. Um, some people may argue that the best user interface is the one that the player will never notice, which is not inherently true. If you think about it, because this is also a form of visual storytelling, it can also fall under the umbrella of art direction. Art directors, going back to this, what little you can see of the UI here, um, but like the shape of the letters here, like the font they chose, the different graphical elements, like the compass and like the daytime nighttime counter, um, the way the hearts are rendered, as opposed to like the fonts here, like those are all very deliberate choices that fit into the art direction of these games and they continue the feeling because the player has to be able to learn this information and have a quick reference available to them, but it doesn't feel like they're leaving the game when they look at the UI. But depending on the kind of experience you want your player to have, more or less obtrusive UI can actually enhance the game feel. Um, because even if you have super, super simple UI, something as small as your font choice can contribute to the feel of the world or even contradict it. Like, unless your fantasy game is a pixel art game, having a pixelated font in a fantasy game feels pretty contradictory because when you see pixel fonts, you are inherently reminded of technology and of a computer screen. And unless the rest of the game looks like pixels, um, it's going to be a little bit contradictory because you aren't associating computer screens with the fantasy world. Uh, but here's, I think, perhaps the most common and iconic example of super in-your-face UI. Um, Persona 5 does not even dream of hiding the UI from you. When you open a menu, you are immediately blasted with like different shapes, even colors, you, there's, they're animated, you see the people in them. It's an incredibly stylish game that's all about like heisting these different things from people's brains. Um, and people love the UI. It is very much not a, a UI that people are able to ignore. Um, on the other hand, to go more recent, uh, Final Fantasy 16 is a very cinematic experience. Um, so the UI they have is very, very minimal. Um, it's very unobtrusive. You have to deliberately enable more of it if you want to see it. So like you can press the map. Um, but the symbols they use, like these little crests and kind of like heraldry almost, looks in universe is just enabling a little bit of convenience that reminds you that this is a video game. And the font choices they use is very simplistic and does not contradict anything. Um, it is as unnoticeable and as um, efficient as possible. But even when the game is in scenes with dialogue, the text does not dominate the screen. It stays lower and does not have any extra um, visual elements unless they're enabled for accessibility. So. Moving on from visual storytelling, we're gonna to go to audio storytelling. This is something I have the least experience with and have in my own personal projects, either ignored entirely or hired other people to work on with me. So please bear with me. So audio design in games is one of the secret weapons that help contribute to game feel. Not even just talking about narrative, but just the way a game feels because it's essential to providing feedback to the player. Feedback is when the player's actions result in a unique response from the game system. Um, so for example, when you're playing a driving game and you press a button to honk the car horn, or when you're adding gas to try and go faster and you hear the game uh, add the engine noise like revving up for the car that you're driving in the game. 
When you're looking at audio design from a narrative perspective, you need to consider the sounds of the world of your game. Like what kind of creatures are there? What kind of instruments do people use? Is it a pre or post industrial world? When you're in a city, do you hear the sounds of cars or do you hear the sounds of horse-drawn carriages? Um, can you, continuation of that is music, obviously, but in addition to making your sound effects sound like they come from the world, you can apply this thinking to your music compositions as well. Music can contribute to world building, not only by your instrumentation choices, but by the compositional style. Audio intertwines with visuals to contribute to the tone of the game and convey emotion where there isn't any written text. Like if you think of that game, Grease, um, all you have are the visuals, mechanics, and the audio. And it's a very powerful emotional experience regardless of the fact that it doesn't tell you what the story is, you're able to learn it and feel it just through those elements alone. Um, we just took a break, so I hope you guys don't mind, but let's go ahead and skip this one because I went through the slides faster than I thought I would. Um, but the last little element that we're going to talk about for platformers is writing, and this is going to get more specific to platformers. So writing for a platformer, when you're working within a known genre of video games, you need to familiarize yourself with the defining traits of that genre and the expectations players will have coming in. So I personally have never written for a platformer or done any narrative design, but the way that I would immediately start my work if I was asked to is to research the genre and see what other games are doing and how narrative and in-game text is utilized in those games. With platformers, most players don't really anticipate intensive branching narratives and visual novel-esque dialogue. If you want to intentionally do, um, if you want to, sorry, I can see the chat and I'm getting a little bit distracted by it. Um, if you want to intentionally add a more visual novel-esque element to your game, that's totally fine. You're just going to have to advertise that it's a story-driven visual novel platformer hybrid uh, because people don't associate platformers with story with heavily story-driven content. In general, when you're writing for a platformer or another like mechanics and gameplay focused game, the writing is going to be very specific and efficient with its time because the main draw of that genre is the mechanical gameplay and the systems, not necessarily the writing. So in order to not frustrate players and like make them bored, you've got to give them the information that they need and maybe don't want as quickly and as efficiently as you can and then get out of their way so they can keep running around and jumping. By extent, the writing in these games tends to be pretty short and to the point with a lot less meandering and back and forth and a lot more direct information. If you want the writing in your game to serve narrative purposes, you still need to be efficient with the player's attention span. You can't have characters launching into deep monologues about themselves, about their families right from the jump. You need to give the player time to become more invested in the game before they become more tolerant of things that might interrupt their experience. You need to be aware of the size of your text boxes, how many lines a player clicks through and how long those lines are and how much information you're giving them at a time. You need to keep in mind as well that any written, in the te written text in the game will contribute to the game's mood and tone. If the game looks really dark and horrific, but the dialogue is cutesy and cheesy, then the player is naturally going to notice that disconnect and it will interrupt their immersion unless they've been taught by the game to expect this kind of dissonance. So because that's the end of my slides, we can go ahead and hit some questions. So there's one in the chat. Would you say there's one kind of storytelling more efficient or ideal than another, or does it depend on the game? Uh, it absolutely depends on the game. Um, If people are raising their hands, I can't see them. So I will be relying on people to, okay. Uh, could I give examples of that? Where, I'm not sure I totally understand where would music be ideal? 
Um, I think, okay, here, let me, let me answer this question and then we'll go to the, oh, the hand went down. Um, well, if it comes back up, we can answer it. But uh, musical storytelling, I think, should take the forefront of a game where you're telling some the player that the music is essential to the game um, and that music is a part of that narrative. Um, honestly, in an ideal world, you would want to prioritize all elements of a game um, to make them feel to make them resonate with each other and feel cohesive to the story that you're telling. But um, if you're not given the opportunity uh, to do that on a platformer, then you need to prioritize what you can. And that usually ends up being just like the in-game writing uh, and maybe the mechanics and level design as well. The first, like for, for me personally, the first things I think of for a platformer, when I think of things that I can use to tell a story, immediately I think of the level design and of the art assets for that level design. Um, let's go ahead and hit that raised hand then. Uh, you knew when you can, I'm uh, asking you to unmute so that you can uh, ask the question. Uh, uh, hey, good day. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, sorry I joined late. Uh, you might have answered this earlier, but uh, I'm approaching a... a or I have ambitions of uh, making a game that's mostly story driven, mm -hmm. multiple branching endings. Uh, like my original scope, because I want it done, is uh, it's the story of a ghost who haunts a house for a week. And depending on what he does, uh, different things do happen. So branching paths, replayability, etc. Uh, how would you recommend I write for this? Uh, my original thoughts were uh, I should like have like certain conditions, say four or five, depending on which are ticked and which are unticked, by what point this certain day should play out. Mm -hmm. If you get what I'm saying. And yes, I, I, do. I should have like a variety of days worth uh, to do things. Now I'm very early in this. I haven't done much about it. It's mostly an idea. Yeah. Is there anything so, I should know before, like this is a pitfall, uh, beware, etc. Sure. So I think my biggest advice for if you're going to be having multiple endings and multiple paths is I think you should start with the endings first. I think you should decide what the possible outcomes are before you tell me the ways that you can reach them. Because if you start from the beginning and then branch out, it's really easy to fall into the trap of being like, okay, so the player could do this or this. Oh, but they could also do this. Um, because it's really easy for choices to balloon out of your control. So if you have the ending set, it means that you're trying to figure out how to get from point A to point B, as opposed to point A to whatever happens, happens. Because, um, it's you need to be able to keep your branches in check and be able to bottleneck them where it's appropriate and be aware of the scope of your game and restrain things where you can. Oh, I see. Thanks. Uh, thing is, the game is very comedy based, so it's more of uh, scenarios happening, uh, happening list of scenarios rather than straightforward endings. If you That's get fine. what I'm saying, but still, yeah. yeah, I assume that the advice still applies. Yeah, the advice still applies, um, even if it's just a variety of different scenarios. Um, you want to be conscious of how what it takes to get to those scenarios and what factors contribute, um, and how many factors could be used for multiple different ones, and like, say, like your ending depends on knocking over a glass of water on somebody's head. Um, 
what different what different situations could that lead to that could lead to somebody like freaking out and thinking there's a ghost or it could lead to them just getting like really pissed and leaving the house or if they're holding their phone like maybe it leads to their phone short circuiting like think of these different like possibilities because it also helps keep your uh the amount of variables that you're tracking under control as well because that can also really balloon out of control um I hope that helps yes okay how much I'm going to go back into the chat a little bit more uh how much text is too much text in my opinion for a platformer um I would say the way that depending on Okay, so this is incredibly subjective and is my personal opinion. Um, when I'm playing a platformer and if I talk to a character, I expect them to give me one sentence at a time, maybe two max. Anything longer than two sentences is going to feel overwhelming and not really fun to read in a small text bubble. If it's at the bottom of the screen, like in a traditional text box and like visual novel style, I would still say you don't want to exceed three three sentences per text box um, just because um, the players are more likely to skip through these things if it's all being given to them at once. If you pace out the text that's given to them, they'll get a little bit of information from each, even if they're reading really quickly and skipping through it because at least they're skimming multiple parts of the of important information as opposed to skimming everything at once and only getting the first sentence. Um, let's see. Um, if the game is based on the idea of the same events repeating again and again, what would I recommend you do to avoid the players getting bored? Um, so, I actually recently watched the movie Groundhog Day, so this is kind of fresh in my mind, but one of the things that we watch that you can do is provide more activities and like available actions to the player than they are able to actually interact with during one instance of that event playing through. Because if they have to be efficient with their time and can only choose a limited selection of all the things available to them, they're going to go for a few things at first, but may even wish that they could go back and touch the other things. Um, so if you're expecting them to loop through the scenario over and over again, um, before even requiring there to be any like variation, if you just have a lot of content that they're una naturally unable to get to, they'll be able to sort through all of that first. And then you can start inter, um, what's it called? Introducing new variables. Um, if you keep track, one of the ways that you can do this with introducing new variables, you can pay attention to and have a variable to track like how many times a player does this throughout each successive loop or how many, or like how long does it take a player to do this and like have certain events only available after a amount of time has passed or something like you can have variables that carry over from repeat like through the repetition of these events and then unlock new things that are gated by those variables um it's a little bit abstract but um if you've ever played outer wilds one of the things in that game's core game loop is that the world is too large and the time frame of the loops are too short to do everything in each loop. So the expectation is that the player is going to keep looping until they know the most efficient route to reach the ending of the game. Um, considering that there's many forms of platformers, does your opinion on having too much dialogue apply to all of them? Banjo-Kazooie has a ton of dialogue. So I don't, I'm not really a platformer aficionado. Um, I do not play a ton of them because they are not really my thing because I'm not really into mechanics focused experiences like that. 
the mechanics that and systems that I'm most interested in are the ones where narrative directly interacts with them a little bit more. Um, but I think the issue here is that it's not that I don't think platformers shouldn't have a lot of dialogue. I just think that I, because dialogue in itself is, I think, the most engaging form of writing in a game because players will tolerate characters talking to each other if it's interesting. Um, but you're not going to be expecting like like Dragon Age level codex entries from Banjo-Kazooie because you're not, that's not what you're there for. Um, so I don't think having a lot of dialogue in a platformer is bad. I just think that the rate at which you give that dialogue to the player should be easily digestible and easy for them to skip through if they want to, because that is my understanding of platformer player expectations. Well, it looks like we don't have any more questions. Oh. Oh, what would I create if I had unlimited funding and skills? I want to make a tactics RPG so badly. I really, really, really want to make a tactics RPG like Final Fantasy Tactics or Fire Emblem uh, or Tactics Ogre or Triangle Strategy. Um, but I really want to have a lot more complex narrative systems within them because I think there's a lot of really untapped potential for uh, unique, like tiny salient narratives between characters um, and like factors that alter the world. Um, but I'm not a game designer. And if I want my studio to be playing, to, to invest in making a tactics game, then I gotta really pitch it to them. Uh, and I don't know that the interest is there at the moment. Am I going to be playing Baldur's Gate 3 next week? I don't know. That might be too big. <laughs> That's it's kind of scary to me. I'll I'll check it out maybe because I have some friends who worked on it. Um, but I'm also kind of not that invested in the world of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so it's like kind of I I'm I'm not really a D and D fan. Uh, and it's also like literally so there's so much variation that it's almost overwhelming. Um, I play other tabletop role playing games. I'm one. Of, I'm like a pretentious tabletop player that's like I've played D and D and other systems, and there's better systems out there. Um, hey, if you like D and D, go for it. I just my my biggest issue with Dungeons and Dragons is that it's um, any storytelling that happens in that game is despite its mechanics, not because of them. There are other tabletop role-playing games out there that actually incentivize you to role-play and are more than just numbers crunching. I think it's too quantitative and too easy to min-max and less quality-based mechanics, which is my priority in a role-playing game. Uh, I really like the Forge in the Dark system, so like Blades in the Dark and Beam Saber are some favorites of mine. Yeah, each to their own opinion. Um, have I ever played this guy yet? And if so, what do I think? I have not played it yet. Um, I recently inherited a bunch of um, old consoles and game and, and like really old games. So I've been in the process of like hunting down um, the components for those consoles that are missing to be able to play through this backlog of really old games. So at the moment, I was just recently able, I just acquired a memory card for GameCube. So I've been playing Bat and Kaidos, um, which is not Disgaea at all. But like to give you an idea, I was like, I'll probably get there at some point. Um, but I'm like kind of like like pawn star, like pawn shop hunting almost 
to try and find the different like old JRPGs and necessary uh, physical hardware to play these games. Um, the other things that I inherited from this person who left behind all this stuff in my apartment is also real katanas. Um, would you like to see them? <laughs> Hold on. This is real metal. It's heavy. Um, yeah, the person who used the person who lived here before me and before my friends who I got uh, the lease from just left all of her stuff behind. And the, these were just in our closet. Um, the, yeah, there's there's a, a katana and a wakizashi, the little guy, um, just in our closet. And I thought they were umbrellas or something because I just saw the handles behind like a stack of board games. And I was like, eh, we'll get to them eventually. I'll deal with that later. And then I had a friend over who knew the person that used to live here and looked in the closet and she was like, oh, Jess's katanas are still there. And I said, Jess is what? Um... But yeah, this person had katanas. They also had um, some really expensive like retro games that I have no way of playing. Like I didn't even know what the Turbo Graphics was, but I found a bunch of Turbo Graphics cartridges. They left behind a Dreamcast, um, a GameCube. Yeah, that's it's kind of crazy. Um, but we met her recently. She stopped by in January. And she told us that if there's anything we don't want to keep, we can just get rid of it. So we've been going through all the stuff that was left behind and uh, seeing what we want to keep, what we want to sell, and if there's anything that our friends want. Um, and I'm of the opinion that we should keep the katanas because I think they're fucking funny. Um, hi, Onion. Onion knocks them over a lot, though. Um. So yeah, um, to kind of like wrap all of that into the questions that's been asked of me, uh, I'm not playing a lot of games that are coming out right away because I have all of these old games that are really hard to get their hands on that I'm interested in playing as my backlog because, um, you know, like I've played with emulators before, but I really love being able to have like the original intended controls like the old clunky controllers in my hands um and be able to play the game on the platform they were meant to some games don't look as good on a flat screen as they did on a crtv so it's like i take what i can get but um i am neglecting a lot of games as they come out just because i'm very busy and then also I really want to try and play the original Bat and Kaidos before the remaster drops on Switch. Um, there is one game that, that's coming out in September that I'm really excited for. It's called Chance of Sinar. And it's a language game that it's completely textless, but you are interpreting these different characters, like, like language characters, um, and translating them to each other to solve puzzles. Um, and I think it's just a really beautifully made game and really effective puzzle design. Uh, it was also a selection at the Tribeca Festival in June. So I got to play it as part of that exhibition. And uh, it was my favorite. It was my favorite demo that was there. I think I went back to that demo like five times because it was like a 45 minute long demo. And I would like give it up to let other people play it. But I was like, I want to go back and finish it. It's really really cool um we still got like 18 minutes to go. <laughs> um you, uh, if you got 
sorry you don't have to <laughs> if you don't want to yeah I might um I might leave in a few just because I do have a lot of work to get back to and this is in the middle of my work day but okay. if anybody wants to ask me like career questions or like stuff that isn't necessarily like practice based but it's more about like getting work as a narrative designer or stuff like that I'm happy to talk about that too I, I do have one actually. Sure, what's up? Um, how do you go about uh, seeing like, because of course, when, especially when you're working like with a narrative designer or as a narrative designer, you know, like the message of your game and whatever you want to tell is like something that's usually like important to your game uh, if you're in, at that stage. So how do you go on about finding people that you feel fit in with your general values and what you want and the messages that you want to include? What, um, what would you recommend? So that's actually kind of a difficult question to answer because Twitter is literally dying as we speak. Oh, I'm sorry, X. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because Twitter kind of was game dev LinkedIn. Um, it's how I met Ashraf. It's how I met the people that I work with now. Um, but really the best networking advice I can give people is to First of all, just show up, just keep showing up, just keep meeting people. And then, um, I don't know, cultivate actual friendships with people and like get to know them and get to know them outside of their work because um, the most natural and strongest connections you'll get in game spaces comes from when you treat other people like people. Um, and even if you're if you know somebody who isn't super experienced, they're still your peer in the industry. And as you get more experience, so will they. Um, and they end up being your biggest resources. Um, for finding people with similar values, that's really tricky because um, the game space is inundated with so many people that just want to make games, but everybody has a different idea of what games are and what they want from games. Um, I've been incredibly fortunate in my time at co op because. Our studio is a worker-owned co-op that's run by um, a Lebanese uh, studio director. And it's like a majority of like queer and trans worker owners. And we're all paid the same. We all have really strong collective belief in equity and justice and like treating workers fairly. And that also translates to the games we tell and like the worlds we imagine. Um, but it is also kind of, a unicorn in the game space um and the way that I actually found it at all is because Selim the studio director was supposed to give a speak like was supposed to give a talk at my college when I was still an undergrad um and I saw after I was told that this person was going to be speaking I looked into them and I was like oh my gosh this is a Lebanese person in games there's not that many of us um and i followed them and then kept in touch and then eventually like we became friends um all of my work in games so far has been with other Lebanese people who are outside of Lebanon and are somewhat are alienated by the games industry at large because people don't really understand the lived experiences that we have especially as queer and trans people um so finding the people like you and holding on to them and like finding people you like is I think the most important part even if you don't plan on working with them right away and naturally the work will come um or eventually you guys will get fed up and make yourselves that space um what would I recommend somebody do to get an entry-level job as a narrative designer <laughs> that's the hardest question to ask um, and hardest question to answer. So narrative design is, I think, one of the most, yeah, shout out to Alex from Soft Not Week. Um, I'm actually living in their old apartment right now, but um, what's it called? So entry-level gigs in game design and in the in game development are incredibly hard to land because they fill up unbelievably fast um 
if they are publicly listed at all, they get hundreds of applicants. And a lot of them aren't publicly listed. They usually tap internal networks of connections to be like, hey, do you know anybody for this? Or I already know somebody who would be good for this. Let's make a role for them in our studio. So instead of looking for the unicorn entry-level gig that is full-time and pays well, the traditional route to actually start getting work in games and building up your experience is to start contracting and do some freelance work as a narrative designer and as a supplemental writer. So before I was hired at co-op full-time, I actually was a part-time worker there. Um, well, no, but let me rephrase. I was a limited time contractor there. My original contract at co-op on Goodbye Volcano High was only for a few months. And then the work continued, so my contract got extended. And then after a full year of me working there, they were like, hey, we like you. We like the work that you've done. We want you to work on our future projects with us. We want to make you a permanent member. And that's how it happened for me. This is not inherently an entry-level job. It's a role that they made for me after seeing my work with them and for other people and kind of like incrementally increasing my contract um, and like retaining me for just a little bit longer. Aside from this, I've also done consulting. I've done freelance illustrations. I've done um, part-time work uh, with Alex of Soft Not Week on Spirit Swap. Um, and in the midst of all of that stuff, I've been applying for uh, more formalized gigs and AAA roles. But even if I get an interview, and they're usually interviewing so many people um, that it's like you have you have to really really stand out or just be incredibly lucky to get a gig. So um, not to like scare you away from applying to places as a narrative designer, but um, keep in mind that most of the work that you're, you're probably going to get off the bat is going to be small short-term stuff and you just want to see as get as much of that as you can and work with as many people as you can just to get those endorsements in and eventually uh you'll find something comfortable in long term all right i think i am going to go ahead and head out here if that's all right because I'm getting some pings on Slack that I can no longer ignore. Yeah, I'm ha I'm happy to talk about career stuff. Um, it's it's very uh, daunting, and people like to really keep their secrets because everybody gets really scared of you know like competition. But I honestly don't think that we should be scared of competition. We should be lifting each other up and taking each other with us. So uh, if you guys are interested in following up with me at any point, feel free to follow me on Twitter while it still exists at Jenna Yao. My email is jenna at coop.com. If you'd like to reach out to me there, I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm also in the Discord server, uh, not that hard to find and easily taggable. So if you have any longer form narrative design questions or if you had something you were too shy to ask, feel free to reach out. I will absolutely get back to you when I can. Um, and again, thanks so much to Ashraf and Sasha and the whole Gaming Academy team for having me for yet another talk, four talks in three years, absolutely crazy, um, but it's always a pleasure. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your time. Genuinely, it was amazing. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording. Hold on. That's good.